Oh, right. Let's get started. Um, so today we're going to move on to another topic. Oh, I was going to mention about what I meant. Okay. Before I um, start the start, uh, a few things. Um, on the syllabus, I guess I said there would be another mini quiz type thing today. Um, I think actually sort of given the topics that we're going to cover, um, I think it actually makes sense to just have a mini quiz sometime this week, which will cover um, like generally, I think, you know, generally speaking, the language model word embedding stuff. Um, so I'll send out some details about that. Um, yeah, uh, and then because the last week, I'm guessing we'll spend a lot of time uh, more on sort of the neural network stuff, which will be directly related to your homework. Um, so I'm not sure if we'll need to do a mini quiz. Um, in any case, you know, I think these quizzes, I'm going to give you guys ample time, you know, like day or two's notice and you can do them in a day or two as well. So there's no rush, it's all open book anyway, so, okay. Um, yeah, so I sort of, last lecture, I sped through the ending of a word embeddings, um, sped through t uh, and actually I didn't even get to talk about the sort of really fun application, which I think I might've mentioned in the beginning of class. Um, you know, and I sort of just wanted to spend a minute or two on this, um, which is that, like, you know, as you see in your homeworks, for instance, you can look at interesting types of data sets. If you look at them in a different light, you can sort of take advantage of their structure to get interesting insights, right? So uh, in the case of music, you can actually look at playlists and look at the co-occurrence relationships in playlists as a way to measure, you know, artists or songs or whatever, right? Um, and so the sort of the cute application that the the people who um, I forgot who there Susan Athey, some economist at Stanford, um, what they looked at was shopping cart data, right? So this was actually physical shopping cart, but I guess now you can look at like Amazon shopping carts or whatever, and like you know one card itself is basically like a document, right? So within that card, um, you can basically think of them as some co-occurrence. And then you might try to embed these products that you're buying, you're selling on your market into some high dimensional space. And maybe you can figure out, you know, some interesting sort of facts about these products. Um, and so in the previous slides, uh, I won't go through them. Uh, there's a little bit of work to, to do this, but you can essentially, once you've done some embedding, you can actually learn things like, you know, if I have a particular product, what are the substitute goods and what are the complementary goods? Uh, so that's like Econ 101. And this is a really sort of cute application because it's like, you know, this is something that's just learned from the data of like shopping carts, like people literally, you know, constructing shopping carts while they, uh, while they do shopping. So, so I think, you know, you know, I can't really think of that many other examples, but at least these two examples, I think they're pretty surprising if you hadn't thought about them before. Um, obviously, after you've seen them, you're like, okay, cool, it makes sense. I have a collection of goods. Um, you know, there's some meaning to this collection. Why have I constructed these collections? And so maybe I can extract something more, you know, interesting about these individual items that I put in my collection. Okay, so. We're going to move on to a basic, a, ver a very different topic. Um, it's a little bit like the homework that we uh, you did as well, in the sense like um, with a lot of these models that we're going to discuss. So the sort of thing, the thing we're going to end up looking at is recurrent neural networks. Um, some of you have who are taking other classes in machine learning or deep learning will have probably seen recurrent neural networks, um, but like. What you realize about this field is that, you know, people are all sort of singly focused on sort of the state of the art or like, you know, this deep learning method is amazing and, you know, 
what they don't realize is that sort of there are years and years of historical, you know, developments of like more classical models that actually, you know, contain a lot of interesting insights and, you know, it's sort of a short step to get from those models to sort of the state of the art models that you deal with nowadays. Um, so, you know, since this is like an intro to machine learning, you know, I don't want to just give you the latest and greatest. I think it's much more interesting to sort of look at this from a historical perspective and see sort of the development trajectory of these sequence models and how we end up naturally in some sense with recurring neural networks and then following on from that, uh, these LSTMs, stuff like that. Okay. Um, any questions? I guess not. Uh, you know, again, if you have questions, just you can use the raise hand functionality. Okay, so today we're going to talk about sequence models. Um, and obviously, depending on the time, we'll get to uh, recurrent neural networks. So we're going to basically talk about, start with hidden Markov models, which is a very general type of model, uh, then a particular instance of a hidden Markov model is a common filter. Um, finally, that brings us naturally to then talk about recurrent neural networks and then sort of the really surprising um, power of these pretty straightforward models, recurrent neural networks, just through some examples. And so one thing to note is that um, you know, these, one that you can think about them as basically latent variable models. I mean, I'll sort of, I'll sort of be clear um, in a little bit, but they operate in a similar way to, uh, you know, the topic models where you're sort of setting up a latent variable that is hidden, but then from those latent variables, you, you know, something happens and it creates data and the data is the thing you're observed. And you basically want to do some reverse engineering to figure out what the latent variables were. Okay, so this is a very simple but powerful mechanism to describe, to sort of configure your models. Um, and we'll see that actually hidden Markov models are actually like very, very powerful. Okay, so yeah. So, you know, this is not going to get into all of the technical details because uh, these are pretty classical uh, things. Um, you know, they, you can get into the weeds with like the, the actual mathematics of these. Uh, so we're going to gloss over a lot of that. It's mainly just to provide sort of a background and intuition to help motivate in some sense, like where recurrent neural networks, you know, the, the idea of them, how they might have sort of appeared organically from sort of the previous work. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So let's revisit our, I wouldn't say our favorite model, but sort of the thing that, why is this always up? Sorry. Um, that page. Okay. All right, so let's think back to this class-based language model that we have, right? So this class-based language model looks like this. Um, and one way you can do this is like, you can basically always, you know, draw these kinds of graphical models representation, right? So we have is, let's say W1, blah, 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 W, and minus one, WN, and then here, we have C n minus one, C n, C n minus two. Okay, and so if you look at this class-based language model, you can sort of think of it as this type of. Uh, okay, sorry. That should be clear. C one gets there. Right. So this is sort of a graphical representation of what your class-based language model is, right? So if you think about the way we do this decomposition, here, that's, that's sort of this arrow here, and that's this arrow here, right? So what that's saying is that 
basically in order to predict the next word, all I really need to know is sort of the class label of the previous word. Uh, and through that, I can then predict the next word, right? Um, so everything basically operates through the class labels themselves. Okay, so one thing that's really important here though, uh, and sort of you'll sort of understand this in a little bit, these are not random, right? So, so these are non-random, right? So, so they're not random variables. And what we'll see is that if you make them random variables, then you basically get the hidden Markov model, okay? But the key point is that these are not random. And so there's actually not that interesting of, a, of an infrastructure in this, in, in this likelihood, right? Because they're not random, then you don't have dependencies, right? Um, so if you, you know, because if you think about, if you think about this guy here, what does he depend on? All he really depends on is the CN minus one. So you you only have to look one step back, right, to, to figure out sort of what this guy is. Okay. So I didn't need this. That's fine. So I'm going to go back to that. Oh. If the classes aren't random variables, what does it mean to talk about their, sorry, yeah. So there's a question here. If the classes aren't random variables, what does it mean to talk about their probabilities? Uh, yeah, so good question. So here, this P is, it's not really a probability, right? It's, it's sort of saying, let's figure out what, so, so, so how, how did we do this, right? So we're basically assigning a probability. Okay, so we are assigning probabilities to these things, but there's no randomness in it because these Cs are just categories, right? And so then we're basically assigning sort of a, a number to this value itself. But there's, no, there's nothing random about the Cs itself. Right, so, okay. Yeah, it's so, okay, you're right. This, this does seem a little weird. Um, so if you think about what we're trying to do here, right? So if I, if I know, okay, so, okay, let me, let me just give you one example here. Um, so let's say this word is, uh, this, this word is eats, this word is food. And so then let's say the cluster, the cl cluster of this, co the class that this corresponds to is like um, you know, verb. And then this is like uh, food. Okay, food is not a good example. Let's, it's like uh, uh, the pie. Okay. So if this was, if C's were random variables, then basically, you would have to, um, you'd have to worry about like the C's itself being different, right? Um, but here, the C's are not, their C's are basically predetermined already, right? If I give you my W and the C's are essentially fixed, right? So then you really just have to look up the table. Well, what did I sign the, so yeah, I guess you shouldn't really call it likely, you shouldn't really call it probability, but it's essentially probability. But you said, what's, what, what do I sign the value that I transition from a verb to a food next, right? Um, it would be different, right? So, so this is how I, I, I get a hidden Markov model. A hidden Markov model, how do I make this a random variable? Is if basically what I do is if the C's are sort of, random variables that correspond to a class, for instance, right? So a hidden Markov model, how, how would that work? How would, I, how would I sort of get a similar idea here? Basically what that would be is I would basically flip a coin, a die, 
right? A die that corresponds to a class. From that die, then I can calculate my w, wn. So, right, so, so given a particular class, I'm gonna draw a word from that class, right? And then how do I get from the first class to the next class? I'm gonna have a probability model itself, right? So the key point is that this, this, the variable itself, this C, the value of C is going to be random, right? Whereas in the, in the class-based model, the transition moving from one to another that, you know, you have to have, have to, it has to be sort of, you know, it's, it's a little bit like a random variable, but it's not, but so the transitions have to sum up to one, right? Cause I need to, you know, I need to transition from one state to the next state, but the actual state itself is not random. Okay. Yeah. So this, yeah, no, this is, this is a really good question. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Right. So in this class-based language model, the C's are not random because you basically know the C's from the W's, right? The C's are just something, I mean, the way you do the class-based class, class language model is you fix the uh, classification of your words, right? Suppose I've already fitted my class-based language model. I fitted the, the, cluster, uh, the clustering of the words. Now my CN is just a function of my WN, right? Um, if I wanted to convert it into a hidden Markov model, which involves actually having every variable here, right? So this variable, this variable be a random variable. One way you could do this is you could say, all right, so I'm gonna draw C, right? So, so CN, you know, uh, drawn from a multinomial, oopsies. Autonomial, uh, you know, some with some data uh, corresponding to a class. Okay. And so, you know, if the CNs are actually random, then all of a sudden you actually have a lot of, a lot more structure. Um, and that's, that's actually essentially what a hidden Markov model is. So a hidden Markov model is basically when you have this graphical uh, form here, right? And the key point is that the Cs are unobserved, right? So these are the hidden variables. The Ws are the observed variables, right? But these are all random variables. And the way they relate to each other is that basically Wn only is a function of CN. Once I know CN, I basically sort of generate WN from that. CN is a function of CN minus one, and that's how everything sort of relates to each other. Okay, so uh, let's go to, okay, so yeah. So basically the key point here is that now the classes are latent variables that are random so essentially, you know, I flip a coin or flip a die or, if, you know, or I draw from a random normal, uh, from a normal distribution, for instance. And it might not seem like this makes any difference, but if you remember topic models, right? Like when you, when you did all the, like, the calculations for topic models, what you notice is that like when your parameter is fixed or is not random, you basically don't need to worry about it when you're calculating likelihoods, right? Um, so the fact that you have a random variable there that's you know that's that's random, that actually basically allows you to extend the dependencies um, sort of over time. Actually, it's you know it's like it's like the Gibbs sampling thing. It sort of basically goes back, uh, you know, across the whole way. Um, yeah, so actually, okay, well, um, no, I don't, I don't want to confuse you even more. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're gonna look at this, All right? So, so this is, this is the graphical representation of my hidden Markov model, right? And, you know, with, with all of these latent sort of latent variable models, you need to be careful about what you're not observing and what you are observing, right? So I'm observing the words, 
right? These are realizations of these, the random variable WT. And the key point is that it's not that the WT directly relates to WT minus one, is that the, the WTs relate to each other through this uh, hidden variable layer that you just don't, okay, I don't wanna say layer because then you might think it's the neural network thing. But it's basically these hidden variables that they themselves relate to each other, right? There's this like thing that's going on in, uh, in the background and then they emit a piece of data as a result of their state, right? So I'll, I'll give you other, well, mm, okay. Let me, let me give you a, an example of this and we're gonna work through this again. So sometimes it helps obviously to have examples, uh, like more like physical examples. What you can think of is that you have this S, okay. So one example is suppose you're trying to track animals, right? And you have this particular animal and you have, this animal has a radio collar, right? So you get the signal about, you know, every, every you know, half an hour, your radio, radio collar is gonna like, you know, send a signal back to your home base, right? But the point is that this radio signal is gonna be noisy, right? It's not gonna give you exactly the right pin, the, the right exact point of your animal, right? So what is ST here? ST here basically corresponds to the true position of the animal, right? And here I'm making a really crude assumption where like the true position, like the true movement of this animal is actually very straightforward, right? It only depends on the previous step, right? Suppose this animal is just like, you know, moving linearly or, you know, moving in a straight line or something, right? Then you don't observe the actual position where the animal is. What you observe is this noisy signal of it, right? So every half an hour, you get a noisy signal of this animal's position. That's your WT, right? So how do I construct WT? WT is just my true state of where the animal is. And then I have something random to it. So I add some noise, right? So the WT is a noisy, essentially a noisy version of the state of the animal, the position of the animal. Okay, so that's a, I guess a very practical example. Um, you know, usually when we talk, you know, we've talked about language models a lot. This is, you can think of this as like more about like, you know, constructions of words and ST here could be, you know, sort of the state of the author's, you know, idea about where this document is going. Or something. And then, you know, sort of the ST, you know, could be like the state of mind of the author and then, you know, that that changes over time. And then the way he produces articles that he then creates a word given his state of the mind or something. I, I don't know if that's a good example, but anyway. Any questions? Okay. So, oh, all right. So this, I'm gonna work through this a little bit, all right? This is pretty important. Um, well, okay, well, we're basically gonna derive this. So what I'm saying is that here with this, with this type of graphical model, oh, um, sorry, so here's a question here. Uh, in the topic model, we cared about the latent variables because we were trying to do an analysis of doc topic proportions and topic words. Similarly, why do we care about ST here? Um, so the document example that I gave with like the state of the mind of, uh, of, the, of the author is a little bit weird, um, but like in the animal example, that one is more clear because like ST here is like literally like that's the true trajectory of the animal that I want, right? I want the ST, but I get a noisy example. I get a noisy version of the measurement. And so I would actually care about ST in that case. Um, here, ST, like if you think more about like the constructions of words, um, like the ST, you can sort of, you know, it's, it's like with, these topic models or neural whatever, you can always try to 
interpret what the STs are. Um, and so, you know, I tried to make a very crude interpretation of what the SCR is, like the state of the mind of the author, and maybe, you know, you might care about that. But, but really, in this particular case that I just gave, I would argue that it's more nice in the sense that this provides um, a mechanism to, to describe a way of actually sort of understanding how this document is generated, right? And the key point is that the STs, because of the, uh, the structure of this graphical model, it's able to capture dependencies that are in the, in, you know, in the long run, right? So the whole idea here is that, you know, when I'm creating, when I'm creating words in my, in my document, right? If I have a language model, if I have a biogram model, for instance, right? If you think about a biogram model, the next word only depends on the previous word. Right, that is a silly type of model, right? Like, as we've already said, when I talked about language models, I, you know, obviously it's like the best thing you can do, but it sort of doesn't make intuitive sense to say like, okay, the actual word, my next word doesn't actually depend on the previous hundred words that I wrote. All it depends on is the previous word, right? Okay, n-gram is a little bit better because then I only depend on the last n words, right? But if you, and we're gonna look at, about, we're gonna go through the math in a little bit, but with this hidden Markov model, even though it looks almost the same thing as a language model, actually the probability of the next word is a function of all the previous words that you wrote, right? So actually the, you don't have the nice decomposition you do. Well, it's not really, I mean, it's nice in the sense of it's computationally nice, right? I can basically, uh, split up my joint likelihood into these, you know, into these individual portions, right? But that loses the fact that I then have to assume that the, the current word is only dependent on the previous word. Just with this, just with this like really like cute, not, I won't say cute, but just very simple addition of having these hidden variables that depend on each other. Now, if I actually ask you, you know, what is the likelihood of seeing WN? given all the other ones, it's actually a function of all the other ones, right? So, okay, so just to be more explicit here, if you, uh oh, wrong one. All right, if we look, if we look at our biogram model, right? Pn over Pn minus one, Wn minus two, blah, blah, blah. We basically assumed that you could do this. All right, and this is great for computational reasons, right? It's not so great for, you know, intuitive reasons. It's like, well, this is not actually how we, we write stuff, right? But the nice thing about these hidden Markov models is that you now no longer have this relationship. You no, no longer have this decomposition. It actually is literally going to be a function of the rest. These, you know, in this, in the, in the biogram model circuit, so I'm going to call this the biogram model, um, you know, the dependency only goes back one step. But here, it might not be clear just yet, but in this, the hidden Markov model case, it actually goes back to the very beginning. So you can't, you know, you can't actually simplify this. It ends up just being exactly that for the uh, for these hidden Markov models. So in theory, right? In theory, these hidden Markov models are sort of like perfect, right? Because it's like saying, well. If I'm going to create a language model, then I, I, you know, I want the next word to be a function of all the previous words, right? That that would be the best kind of model, right? Um, you know, and, and you know, we said the same thing with when we for, we talked about language models as well. Like, you know, so this was you know, you could have done this in the beginning in the, in the same case, right? You could have just kept them all there, right? And then we had some calculations where you looked at sort of how many variables there would be, blah, 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 blah. So it obviously it gets pretty complicated if you do it just like that. Here, all it's, we're sort of, it's sort of like a different way of sort of modeling the dependencies between all this stuff. And it turns out it's actually sort of pretty, it's, it's pretty nice mathematics to do it in this way. Um, yeah, okay. So, 
good question. So let's look at a simple example, right? Um, So if I just look at W1, W2, S1, S2, right, this would be the full joint, right? Then basically, what is that? I know W1 is only given by S1. I know W2 is only given by S2. And then I know S1 is only depends on uh yeah, so then I basically have S1 and S2 remaining, right? And then that's just, well, P of S2, oops. Right. So, I mean, so, 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 you, know, so I, you, know, you could do this a little bit more cleanly where, you know, this is literally P1 divided by S1, S2, W2 times P of W2, S1, S2, right? That's just by simple definition. Then this guy is then equal to P of W2 given S2 times P of S1, S2. Okay, so, so I'm, so just being more elaborate about the decomposition, but essentially what you have is if you look at sort of the joint between these two, you get that um, they, dec they, they decompose in this form. Well, this is probably the, the more, more appropriate form, All right? What that means is that if we then look at our full joint likelihood, right? So, uh, sorry, the, 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 the joint likelihood for my W1 and WN, right? This is a thing we look at all the time um, back when we looked at language models, right? What I wanna do is I wanna basically introduce, you know, just through the law of total probability, I wanna introduce all the S1 and S2Ns, right? Oops, please, comma, S1, SN, right? That's just by law of total probability, blah, 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 blah. law of total probability, right? And then, well, just like the decomposition that I had, so I'm not going to like actually work through it. Um, I think it looks something like this: P I W S I, P S I over S I minus one. Right. So essentially. Now you don't have this nice decomposition that we had before, right? In the bigram model, you had the nice decomposition, which is basically a product of the bigrams. Here, the joint likelihood, well, sort of the likelihood of my data corresponds to this. Um, and so you can see that it just doesn't decompose as nicely because and it's really just because of these hidden variables, the S's, right? The, these S's basically inadvertently give you dependencies with all the W's. So, yeah, so I, you know, I think it's, it's very easy to just like look at this and be like, okay, this is just some math, right? These are just some equations, you know, I've defined a different way of doing the equations, but the equations don't tell you the full story here. Like, I mean, they do literally tell you the full story, but it's like the intuition here is, is not from the equations themselves. It's just from the fact that we need to be thinking about, you know, when the goal here is, it's a bit like a language model where we're trying to understand how we, how we're gonna model the next word, right? And, just by this simple sort of different model, you can actually capture dependencies across all your words when you're constructing the next word. Um, what is the index of the sum here indicating exactly? Uh, so I'm not sure what you mean by that, but I'm basically, I and mean, the way I, I did this is basically I looked at 
I, I did the example for W1, you know, for one and two, and it basically decomposes as like that. And so you can just do that. Uh, oh, sorry, of the sum. Sorry, 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 of the sum, not, not, not the product. Oh yeah, so, so the sum here, uh, this is a good question. Um, how would you do this? Yeah, so yeah, so basically, you know, it's a lot, right? So it's really over all values of my state. Is some finite set. Um, you can obviously extend this to, you know, continuous cases and you have to do an integral. Oh, it says my internet is dying. Okay, I think it should be fine now. Uh, yeah, so this is, sorry, I was, yeah, so this is over all possible uh, values that my state can take. Does that make sense? So yeah, so this is just a low to total probability, but like an extreme version of it. Okay. Cool. But um, but um, but um, but where are we? Okay, so yeah, so you know, in the hidden Markov model case, we have this expression here, right? So you can, you know, you can sort of relate this to uh, atomic models, where in the topic model case, what we had was, you know, it looks sort of similar, right? Um, oops, I think it's, yeah, okay. Uh, so it looks sort of similar. Uh, I guess ST here, if we had before, remember ST used to be our ZTs. It's like the sort of like the topic label, right? Um, so with topic models, the the graphical model, you know, if, I mean, if you look at like the, the, sort of the way this thing works, it looks fairly similar, right? But the key difference is that the S or the Zs don't depend on the previous Zs. Right. So you think about like, you know, each word, the, the hidden variable was the topic label, right? But the, we didn't relate the topic labels to, to each other. And so as a result, the word order didn't actually matter, right? But you could have easily created a topic model that actually, you know, was sequential in nature by sort of relating the topic models to each other, right? So you could have then had the topic label could have been related to the previous one, right? So I could generate, how do I generate the next topic topic label? It would be a function of the previous one, which actually, you know, if you think about it, that sort of makes sense, right? Um, so people have done like ways to extend this, uh, this sort of topic models to actually care about uh, the, the sort of the sequence of the words. Um, but, you know, that's sort of, few, that's just research, you know, sort of research level type stuff, which is, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, again, so I'm, I'm reiterating here, but like, this is really surprising. Well, it's not, I don't know if it's that surprising, but like the only difference is that in the topic model, my Zs were just, you know, drawn from something else, right? They weren't related to each other. As a result, I don't have word order. Now with my hidden Markov model, my hidden state is a function of the previous one. That's it, it's just a function of the previous one. All of a sudden, this then guarantees that my model actually cares about word order, right? All of a sudden, by like, you know, in some sense like moving my arrows around a little bit in my graphical model, I've suddenly gotten a much more expressive model for how to construct words, how to construct arguments, sorry. Right. Um, we'll see later that this, you know, this expressiveness comes at a cost, a computational cost, obviously. Um, but you know, for now, it's, you know, on the theoretical side, it's you know, it's it's sort of neat that you can just get this, you know, this dependency just by 
uh, moving the arrows around a bit. Does that make sense? Maybe, hopefully, yes. Any questions? Cool. Oh man, I thought I would be breezing through this topic, but I guess I'm slow. I feel like I'm just going through everything really slowly now, uh, which is, I mean, I'm sure you guys aren't complaining, hopefully. Well, maybe some of you are. Okay. <laughs> So this is a topic where, uh, so this page is something where, you know, if I were actually talking about this in like in another class where, you know, you, know, you, you can basically spend a whole class on hidden Markov models, you know, there's a lot of different types of them. Uh, one of the things you spend a lot of time looking at is basically how you actually solve these, right? You know, how do I actually calculate the joint likelihood of these? Um, suffice to say for this, that there are these things known as forward backward algorithms, or you could use EM. Uh, there are basically many ways you can solve these models. Um, I'm not gonna go into them. Uh, this is a nice pictorial representation that makes no sense. Uh, so let's move on. Okay, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so I was saying, hidden Markov models are surprisingly powerful. The issue with them, and this is the reason why the you know hidden Markov models are not the state of the art anymore. They've actually you know fallen to the wayside, and basically no one really deals with them. Um, but the, you know there was a period of time when like linguistics, a lot of people were dealing with like were uh, using these hidden Markov models as a as a model to you know describe language production. Um, what you find with them is that actually the computation like. They're just, they're just pretty ugly to deal with for two reasons. Uh, so one of them sort of can be seen in this graph. Um, this let me just tell you what the reason is. Basically, they take a long time to sort of actually stabilize and you know reach some sort of like steady, steady state for what you think the, uh, the random variables are, right? So in this particular case, I mean, it's it's obviously a contrived example. Basically, you have this hidden Markov model, which is sort of which has two states, um, and so depending on which state you're in, you're going to admit a different. Uh, so yeah, so so for each state, okay. So sorry. Uh, so you can sort of think of them as sort of a state zero and a state one, and then you have some probability of going back and forth between them. So this is like for each word, for each character in a word, you know, I could be, you know, so it's S1 all the way to Sn, they could either be zero or one, right? And then depending on which state you're in, you're then going to emit a letter with a particular type of probability, right? So the, the, the letter emission probability is just a function of the state. And in this particular case, you're looking at what the probabilities are for each letter, depending on if, uh, if you are in state one. Okay, so this is a, is a very crude model. This is just setting up some you know, contrived example where I have two states and I'm looking at the, predict uh, the, 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 the conditional probability of, a, of emitting a particular letter given that I'm in this state one, right? And so in this particular example, what you see is that basically it takes a really, really long time. You know, it takes, you know, after 650 iterations, you, you, vi you finally get something, but like from zero to 650, you know, through the computation that I haven't described how you actually do it, there's basically no signal. The, the model doesn't know what's going on. It, it can't predict anything. And then you get this really weird phase transition. And then finally, after like a thousand iterations, you stabilize and your model predicts a you know, certain probability for these emission probabilities, right? Um, so the point of this example is just to show that, you know, these things are really sort of difficult to train and they sort of take a long time and they're sort of, they don't, they don't 
perform in like a continuous manner. It's sort of like, yeah, it's very uh, weird when you actually train these models. Even though, as I said, like in some sense, like they're, they're extremely powerful because they're technically able to actually, you know, capture a lot of dependency. Um, the reality is that computation is actually very annoying to deal with here. Um, I don't think I have time for this example, so I, I don't want to go through it. It's, it's a little bit, again, it's pretty contrived and it's a bit weird. Um, basically, the point of this uh, is that hidden Markov models are extremely sensitive to initial conditions, right? So remember, you know, whenever we do these types of algorithms, you need some initial conditions. You need to have some initial guess for your you know, probabilities for everything. Right, and then you, you know, sort of move in some direction that sort of fits your data. Right, it turns out that the hidden Markov models are extremely sensitive to your initial conditions, which is just not good. Right, generally speaking, you don't want it to be sensitive to your initial conditions. Um, you know, it's it's you know, initial conditions is a little bit like a prior. Right, you have some prior that you want that you that you decide on, and then given your training data, you're going to estimate a posterior, and yeah, and you know. Priors are nice because if you have enough data, your priors are actually going to matter too much, right? It's going to be your data is going to wash out your prior. In these hidden Markov models, what you find is that where you start in terms of initialization has a huge effect on where you end up in terms of like what you believe the true model is, and that's just bad, right? You you're not getting consistency. Like you don't want models to be like that. So part of it is just, is just that like these hidden Markov models are just not particularly identifiable. Um, so that's another way to think about them, right? Because it depends so much on the initial conditions, they're just not a very stable algorithm. Okay. Uh, so we talked about this already. Um, you know, you should be thinking about these. You can think about these as like language models um, here. Yeah, so here the the W corresponds to the actual words and the T corresponds to like some noisy text. Um, so so this is similar to the sort of the way we talked about language models. Um, okay, so I don't want to go through that. Um, well, okay, so I guess this is somewhat important to sort of clarify sort of these distinctions. Um, what we're going to see later on when we look at recurrent neural networks is that we're basically going to have a case where I'm going to, you know, so, so the Ws are, are what we're trying to predict, right? The Ws are the words, right? And T here corresponds to the noisy versions of them, right? So for instance, the Ts co could correspond to the, the sounds that you make, right? When you actually say a word. Um, and so usually what you'll do when you do this sort of source channel framework where you actually you know, look at language models is your, your P of W, right? Remember your P of W is your language model, right? And then PT given W is just, just some separate thing that you care about, right? Um, what we'll see is that with recurrent neural networks, you're actually gonna sort of do this directly where you're just going to estimate the Ws given the Ts that you have. Okay, which is why a lot of times, uh, sort of this class of models is called a, is like seek to seek or sequence to sequence models, where you start with a sequence and you want to end up with another sequence, and you're basically relating how these two sequences relate, relate to each other. Okay. The, should be clearer what I mean when I actually talk about recurrent neural networks. Okay. So, um, let me add a new page here. Okay. So, Actually, now I want to go back to the example that I gave in the beginning where I was looking at the animals, right? Um, 
so 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 the classic example of these hidden Markov models um, is the case of the animal, where you can think of like right. So this is sort of the animal, and so you know S one, S two, S three, S four, S five, S six, right? So you know I've sort of discretized sort of his sort of path in 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 the land or the safari or whatever. And then what we get is we get an actual, uh, it's called X, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, X. Um, yeah. So we get the noisy version of it, right? All right, so essentially this is the data you see. Right, so this is data you see, you basically get a noisy version of the true S, which is the S1, S3, S6. So the question is, what is the point of all this? Like, you know, suppose I gave you X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, X6, right? That's actually the data you see, right? So this is, this is, suppose, you know, every 10 minutes, I get a signal from my radio caller for the animal I'm tracking. And these are the six points that I've seen. What, what's the point of introducing this S here, right? Because it seems like, well, if all I know is this point about where they, where, where the animal is, shouldn't I just like, you know, basically fit like a line like that? Like, isn't that all I can basically do? Does anyone have any intu- like, I know this is a really a weird question, but does anyone have any intuition about like what is going on here with these types of kitten models? I mean, you could assume some kind of dependency structure between how the animal moves from one place to the next that would influence it more than just a line. You know, like for example, if the animal is going straight and likes to keep going straight rather than turning, then you could fit that differently than just the best line uh, between the X points. Exactly, right? So yeah, perfect. The key point is that like, yeah, so this basically, this, this line here, well, I actually don't want to delete it. Okay, I'll delete it. Um, this line here, basically, we don't have any sort of requirements about what this line looks like, right? And the point is that if you have information, if you have some inkling about, you know, you understand the general behavior of how these animals move, right? So as you said, like, maybe there's some relationship between the, you know, the first, uh, the ST position and the ST minus one position, that should then guide you in, ter in terms of predicting the actual true, you know, relationship, uh, the, the true position of this animal, right? And that's the key point. Like, so you need that, you need to have a sort of a model of the movement of the animal. And then you have this, you know, then I have a noisy version of it. But if you didn't have that, that model of the animal, then the best thing you would do is just like, you know, fit a straight line or something, right? Oh, okay, maybe you could, appeal to Occam's razor and say, you know, it should be a, it should be a smooth function, but really, you know, the intuition, part of the intuition is that like, yeah, maybe this, you know, this, the true S, you know, okay, this is a really silly example here, but like maybe the true S, you know, fits a parabolic function. Usually it's like the way you do it is like, maybe it has some differential equation or something that would be a, like a, a more complicated version of this. Um, but yeah, so you basically, you know, you assume that the underlying curve has some, you know, has some structure to it. And then you just see a noisy version of that. And then you basically do some fitting. Um, so, yeah. So what is a Kalman filter? Basically a Kalman filter is a particular example of a hidden Markov model where 
instead of dealing with discrete, uh, sorry, like discrete variables, like, you know, multinomials and stuff like that, you're going to deal with continuous random variables. So basically everything is going to be Gaussian. Okay. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to have, I'm going to, I'm going to be annoying as always. I'm going to change, change notation. Uh, so essentially what we have is we have this. Well, I don't need the plus one. All right. So now my XTs, given XT is going to be normal. Uh, what did I have? I had BXT. Uh, nope, I had A. Yeah. AXT. Why am I doing conditional? Sorry, there should be a comma. Gamma. Y t given x t is normal b x t sigma. Okay, um, so so here you can think about this as saying x t is the position is a true position of the animal, right? Sorry. So now, <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> I need to change X's and Y's and S's. Um, okay, so there's a question here. How is this different from assuming the underlying structure we assume you're fitting a line? Um, yeah, so actually like the way I set this up, it, it's a little bit like that, right? Like with linear model, what you're saying is you assume that you have some fit and then you basically are going to you know, assume that the uh, points are, you know, have some noise. Uh, the, the, key, the key point there is that there is no temporal structure there, unless you start dealing with time series, right? That is saying, I just have my covariate, in my covariate space, I have these points and I can fit a line, right? Here, there's actually a temporal structure to it, which is why, you know, which is why I said like, you know, actually maybe this thing conforms to a differential equation, right? Because, you know, differential equations are what you can then to, to look at dynamic behavior, right? So the key point here is that this is a, this is able to capture sort of temporal structure, which is basically, you know, anything sequential, usually you think of sequences through time, right? So it's a little bit similar, um, you know, in this particular case, you, we are actually dealing with linear functionals as well, right? Because here I make, I make this, I make the very stringent assumption that sort of the underlying, you know, the XT, you think of this as a position of the animal. Uh, how do I go to the next position? It's just going to be a linear function of my previous position, right? Uh, here, what is this? This is saying, what is the actual YT? It's just going to be a noisy version of my XT. You know, usually you can just say B equals to I, for instance, right? Okay. Um, so essentially, I don't know how many of you have heard of Kalman filters, but I guess it, I've heard of it like before I was, before I sort of came across this in, in, in this class. Um, and it turns out like it's actually pretty straightforward. So anyone who's like sort of seen Kalman filters before and like was confused, hopefully this is uh, another way to think about it. Essentially it's a hidden Markov model, except I have a particular form for my random variables, right? I'm saying, now I just define these, I, I define these distributions, can these conditional distributions to be normally distributed with some particular parameter, okay? So, so computer is really just saying, okay, I have a Gaussian hidden Markov model. All my random variables are Gaussian and I'm done, right? Okay. Question? Okay, um, so okay, so that, that's all that, blah, 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 the new model. It's a, basically a Gaussian hidden Markov model. You can solve this using the backward forward algorithm, which again, I'm not gonna talk about. Um, hmm. Okay, this is actually a pretty neat example. Uh, so I think I will go over it, even though again, uh, you know, we, don't have too much time. Um, so 
yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I really like examples where like, it's sort of surprising. Like if you look at the data set, there are many ways to solve it. And it turns out you can actually use hidden Markov models to solve this sort of, sort of fit this, fit, fit a model to this type of data, right? So what's the data here? The data here is we have ozone layer information, right? So we have these weather stations that basically are gonna be measuring your ozone, right? And these are gonna be positioned in some space, right? Suppose I'm, I forget the details here. I think we're looking at, uh, oh, uh, stations around Lake Michigan, right? So all th the key point here is that we have the ozone, right? We have this ozone layer. Uh, the colors here correspond to the ozone layer uh, and the value of it, oh, well, sorry, the, not the ozone layer. This is the, the ozone ozone concentration in that area, right? And we wanna, we only see the actual values of it at the station. And what we would want is we would want to be able to estimate the sort of the actual true ozone uh, concentration across my whole area, right? But the key point is I only get it at, at stations, right? At particular stations. And you see here that these stations, you know, they're, they're sort of scattered around. Obviously they're sort of, it's more dense over here. Now uh, there's a few here. There aren't that many over here, some here, some here, and so on and so, on and so forth, right? So th what is it? This is basically time series data where every day what I get is I get values at these stations that correspond to ozone concentrations at that point, right? And so then the question is, how do I estimate this, this, this full color graph, right? Um, and so it turns out you can basically do Kalman filtering or you know, Gaussian hidden Markov models to basically solve this problem. Um, and maybe the, you know, those, those of you who are more uh, intelligent, well, no. The, 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 basically when I first saw this, I was like, oh, I, like, I can't really see how this actually works to actually get the common filtering to go, go through. Um, so it's a little bit uh, tricky. I mean, it's not, it's not too hard, but essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna set up your uh, hidden Markov model in the following way. Um, okay, give me one second. All right, so, whoopsies. Yeah, okay. All right, so really what we're, what, we, what we're saying is, what we have is, okay, I'm just gonna discretize my space, right? So let's just say I have, you know, some n by n blocks that correspond to uh, the space that I'm caring about, sort of the area around Lake Michigan, right? And so what is my XT here? Remember XT is sort of the hidden variables, right? So the XT is basically all of these things, right? So you can treat it as basically an n by n vector corresponding to the ozone concentration. All right. Obviously, I can discretize my discretize my space, you know, even more so that I, you know, I make it finer and finer. But essentially, the way I'm the way I'm going to set this up is the xt is the ozone for that particular, you know, the average of the ozone, but basically the the value of the ozone concentration at that particular block in this area, right? Um, so xt is going to be an n by n vector because you know xts are vectors, uh, so I just basically collapse it into a vector. So it's an n by n vector, um, and that's the sort of the underlying, you know, that's the hidden variable, right? That's the thing I want to estimate. Right? I want to estimate what the tr you know what the what the uh, what the ozone is for my full area. In reality, what I get though, right? I only get basically. Yeah. Right, so yeah, what I'm going to get is basically some well, my YTs are going to be essentially there's okay, so there's going to be some modeling here, right? What is the YT? YT corresponds to the uh, the value of the ozone concentration at that particular lab, right? So the way I can think about this particular you know YT here is that actually 
if you think about it, the YC should basically be sort of, you know, like a local average of the XTs around. Right. So the way I'm going to set this up is the XTs are, you know, the latent variables that correspond to the, the true uh, ozone concentration at that, you know, area in, in my graph, uh, in my, in my uh, you know, Lake Michigan, right? So, you know, so there's a, like Lake Michigan is here, blah, 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 right? And then what I'm saying is, what are the actual data points I get out? YT is going to basically be a local average of the XTs around my uh, station, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be some complicated function. But the key point is that, yeah, the YT is just going to be a local averaging of that XT. And so then once I set up this model, I, I, I now have a model that's fully described. And then I can just basically reverse engineer and figure out what the underlying XTs were, All right? So how am I going to do this? I'm actually going to just, you know, have some assumptions where I basically assume my XT given my XT is one is N of XT minus one sigma, right? So what is T here? T is over time, right? So what I'm saying is over time, I don't expect the like the ozones to change too much, maybe just given some noise, right? Um, that seems like a sort of a crude assumption because you you know maybe you expect there to be like you know movement because of wind or something. So maybe if you knew what, what, you know how the wind moved, then you could you know incorporate that. But we're just going to make a very crude assumption where basically the uh, one way to cr create the next day's ozone is just to basically add noise to the current one. Right, so it's, it's like a noisy version of the next day, which you know maybe it's a little you know because like weather is so chaotic, maybe it just it's fine to just add noise to it, right? And then the yt is just going to be a local averaging of the xts, right? And so what you see is that basically you're able to actually have some you know some pretty nice estimates for your ozone, well, you know, whether or not this actually reflects reality is a, is a separate story, but it, it's sort of surprising to me at least that like, you know, through this process, I'm able to, it's basically like spatial statistics, right? I am now able to sort of capture the spatial aspect of all this. And just through this sort of weird Kita Markov model, I can actually estimate sort of, you know, the movement of ozone, uh, ozone concentrations across the space, right? Um, yeah, so, okay, sorry. So yeah, so basically, you know, this was, this is actually fitting on some data, uh, you know, when you basically you fit a Gaussian hidden Markov model and these are the estimations for the ozone layers at that particular time, sorry, ozone concentrations at that particular, on those particular days. And so you can, you know, you can sort of see as I as I shift from June eighteenth to June nineteenth, I can, you know, it's not it's, it's not that crazy. You can sort of see that uh, the middle part sort of shrinks and then sort of starts to move to the right a little bit. And again, this is there's like, you know, there's no here I am being crude about the modeling, but it's still able to you know capture the sort of these local statistics and the movement of them in quite a nice uh, structure. Anyway, so I thought this was a really cool application of, uh, of these Gaussian hidden Markov models. Um, yeah, so you know, you're basically, you're able to actually, you know, take advantage of the fact that I have multiple, uh, you know, ozone readings across time to sort of, it's like some, some type of local smoothing across time and space in some sense. Okay, cool. All right, so we're almost at the point where I'm, I can say the words recurrent neural networks. Uh, I think they have five minutes left, so it's almost perfect, perfect timing, right? So let's look at this. So the Kalman filtering or the Gaussian hidden Markov model, the way we set that up is we had the X given X minus one, it's gonna be a multivariate normal, right? Uh, then my Y T's given X T's was also multivariate normal, but, 
you know, what I could do is I could have my, the thing I'm actually producing in terms of the data, I can make my data discrete again, right? So this could instead be discrete instead of it being uh, multi, uh, it, it being con continuous, right? So then it's gonna look actually a little bit like uh, word embedding models, right? Because let's see, right? What we have is WT, right? WT is the word uh, given XT, XT is some, you know, some state, right? But the key point is that I can write this, this multinomial as, you know, pi of B X T, where pi is really just, if you remember, sort of the softmax, the softmax function, right? So if I apply a softmax function, then I can basically say, well, then this is just going to be, you know, the, the sum, the sort of the, the ratio between the, ex, the exponential function of the particular value of my BXT matrix and uh, the sum of the rest, right? Okay, so this is sort of, you know, this is not exactly the same thing. So, you know, don't worry too much about this, but the key point is that like here, what I have is I have something that has the multinomial, which is basically calculating probabilities for all possible um, values of my class, right? In in the particular in this particular case for words, it's just over my vocabulary, right? I'm creating a probability distribution over my vocabulary, and then I'm just using a softmax to get the actual probabilities. So you know, if you squint, it's sort of like a word word embedding model, right? But Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to basically a recurrent neural network is going to be very similar to this, right? Well, it's not particularly that similar, but the key point is that we're going to basically look at something that looks like a language model as well as the word embodying model and the common filter, right? So what we have is we have this WT given HT, right? HT was like, in this particular case was the XT here, right? So it's going to be, it's going to look like that, right? But now the way I do this is my HT is going to be a function of HT minus one, right? So the key point here is that we have HT minus one here and HT here. So, Okay, so let's let's look at let, let's think about this, right? The XTs correspond to you know the the hidden variable that's hap that's sort of existing to create the word itself, right? And I'm saying my XTs are related to each other. And then from my XTs, I can then create the word, you know, using this multinomial uh, softmax procedure, right? That, that, will, that will be the Kalman filtering, the Gaussian hidden Markov model, right? Now, how do I get to recurrent neural networks? It's sort of the same idea in the sense that what I have is I have these HTs, which are like the, the latent variables, right? And these latent variables are related to each other. How they relate to each other, they relate to each other through this relationship, right? So this is a recurrence relationship. HT is a function of HT minus one. But the key point now is this HT is no longer stochastic. So it's, just, it's almost like we've gone back to the class-based model again, right? Remember the class-based model, the CTs, they weren't stochastic. Here, the HTs, again, their HTs aren't gonna be stochastic. So it seems like, well, this is going back to square one, right? The whole point of having my hidden Markov model was that the hidden variables themselves, they were stochastic and they were dependent on each other. As a result, you have dependency. But with the recurrent neural network, you don't assume these HTs or the hidden variables are stochastic. They're just a function of the previous one. It turns out that this architecture, because, uh, because you're sort of dealing with it through this neural language model, I remember the neural language model is very, very powerful, right? You just hit it with a lot of data. If I just introduce this HT that sort of like keeps track of like hidden state of the document, 
for instance, even though it's not random, because I've set this up as sort of like a, you know, I, as a neural network where I have a bunch of parameters that I'm trying to learn, that aspect of it actually gets you interesting dynamics. And basically that ends up making it, you know, much more powerful than these sort of normal language models where I treat it as like a bigram, right? Um, okay. So next lecture, oh, uh, yeah, I guess next year I will have to talk about recurrent neural networks. Um, okay. Any questions? <laughs>